Good evening, everyone. We are here with Chip Jones to discuss uh, organ thieves. And uh, I first want to start by introducing Chip Jones himself. So he has extensive experience working as a newspaper reporter and magazine editor, covering stories for the Richmond Times Dispatch, Roanoke Times, and Virginia Business, among others. The journalism achieved by Chip Jones and his colleagues in covering the strike of United Mine Workers of America led to their being 1990 Pulitzer Prize finalists in general news. He received additional awards for his coverage of the tobacco industry in the 1990s, including Philip Morris's top secret nicotine research program. Chip Jones has also written three books in military history, including Boys of 67, From Vietnam to Iraq, The Extraordinary Story of a Few Good Men, Red, White, or Yellow, The Media and the Military at War in Iraq, and War Shots, Norm Hatch and the U.S. Marine Corps Combat Cameramen of World War II. My name is Laura Guidry Grimes, and I'm assistant professor in the Department of Medical Humanities and Bioethics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. I also serve as a clinical ethics consultant for UAMS Health and Arkansas Children's mm -hmm. Hospital. So I have some experience with ethically complex questions surrounding mm -hmm. organ procurement, donation, and eligibility, but nothing quite like what Mr. Jones describes in mm -hmm. Organ Thieves. So I want to, uh, from the depth of my heart, thank uh, Chip Jones for being mm -hmm. here. Uh, Organ Thieves is a phenomenal book, and I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to discuss it. Thanks, Laura. Organ Thieves tells multiple gripping stories at once. On the one hand, we learn the impressive, dark, and gritty lengths that people would go through to advance medical science. The desire to learn more, to play with the line between life and death, and to achieve the previously unachievable led to grave robbing and body snatching, extensive and often grotesque animal experimentation, professional rivalries, semi-secret labs, and strokes of genius. Organ Thieves does not at any point suggest that the ends justify the means, however. We see how healthcare professionals, medical educators, journalists, and the public wrestled with and sometimes neglected, deep ethical questions about medical racism, the definition of death, informed consent and paternalism, duties to the dead, human and animal experimentation, bodily sovereignty, mm. role delineation with medical treatment and organ procurement, and public distrust in medicine. Organ Thieves focuses on the story of Bruce Tucker a black man of a lower socioeconomic status who was brought to the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond in 1968, a time of Jim Crow racism and segregation. Tucker arrived at the hospital with a head injury and he was quickly identified as a heart donor for a white businessman. Tucker's donation of his heart and kidneys occurred without the knowledge or consent of his family. The surgeon's success would make headlines though years later, MCV, the Medical College of Virginia, did not give proper acknowledgement to Bruce Tucker or give compensation to his family. Chip Jones threads together these stories of the heart transplant race, Bruce Tucker's death, and the subsequent legal fight for justice on behalf of the Tucker family. Hmm. So with that summary, my first question for you is, what was your inspiration mm -hmm. and motivation for writing Organ Thieves? And how did you first learn about the 1968 case of Bruce Tucker? Okay, Lord, first of all, thank you for that kind introduction. And also, that was an amazingly on-point <laughs> summary of my book. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, base, my, first, my first knowledge of the story came to me when I had left the uh, daily newspaper business and became a communications director of the Richmond Academy of Medicine. Uh, which is the oldest and largest medical society in Virginia. And I was really fortunate to work there. I got to uh, meet a lot of fantastic doctors, including surgeons, including heart surgeons. And along the way, somewhere around 2016, I think, I first started hearing about this historic, amazing you know, moment in uh, Virginia history and arguably even in the national the history of American medicine, because it, it was not only the first uh, heart transplant uh, in Virginia, but it was like the ninth in the United States. And 
it came in during that six month period after uh, the first heart transplant, which we'll talk about tonight with Christian Barnard. So um, that's how I heard about it. And the, the, so the inspiration began for the book as I thought about it as a you know, the long form journalist, someone who'd written uh, books about the military history of the Marine Corps in particular, um, because that's where I grew up <laughs> as a military brat. Um, Initially, this began as kind of a right stuff, the right stuff about, but about the heart transplant race. So it was, that's why you'll see in the book some allusions to the, the, moon, the moon race, because during that same period of late, mid to late 60s, there was a parallel um, competition among all the major, a lot of the major hospitals. And it's hard, probably hard to, to fathom now um, in this day and age, but surgeons were really rock stars back then. And, and, and any of your listeners who are interested, go to the archives and look at Time and Life magazines in the 60s. So it started out with that in mind. And when I learned that the surgeon who actually won the race in December of 1967, Christian Bernard, in, in the strange location of apartheid South Africa, Cape Town, well, he actually had studied at MCV the year before after, if, if you read the book, begging Dr. Hume to please let him come and do kind of a fellowship uh, for three months. And when I learned that I started, I was, I was waiting to write another nonfiction book. And I thought this has the makings of something. So it started out, it started out that way as a concept, but soon in my research, I, I I started not seeing enough about who was this donor. It had a lot about the white recipient named Joseph Klett, who was a guy who had, you know, he'd had like scarlet fever as a child and lifelong, you know, cardio issues. And I thought, who, who, who gave up his heart? And, um, you know, and how had this eager beaver surgical team at MCV uh, decided to take his heart when he was in a comatose state? And when, when I started to get inklings of that general framework of the story, my whole, the, as I say, the, the arc of my narrative shifted a lot um, because it went from just being about medical research to, to really justice and some of the things you so eloquently stated. So that's when I really dug in as a, as a reporter, as an investigative journalist type, uh, and started to find out more about how Tucker's heart could have been taken, and was it a theft? You know, and what were all the issues around it? And, and then my narrative shifted more when I managed after pleading with former Governor Doug Wilder, who, who some of your listeners may not know, was the first elected black governor in American history. Uh, Doug Wilder is actually a, a professor at VCU now, has a, has a program and a building named after him, but for some reason, I could, it took me a year to get through them. But I finally just said to an to a intermediary, uh, this is a story, we need to tell this story, you know? And this guy's been wrong, Bruce Tucker, so let's not wrong him again. And, and any of your readers who are interested, um, he has a, a memoir called Son of Virginia. It's pretty good, it's like most memoirs, very self-serving. But there's only like four pages about the Tucker case. And those intrigued me because there were just enough details to kind of like whet my appetite some more. So that's how it all started. That's how it all started. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. So can you help provide the broader context for what happened to Bruce mm -hmm. Tucker? I know that's a big, big question. Yeah. A lot of the book is dedicated sure. uh, to that, that backdrop. Um, okay. But part of my interest in asking is how can this case of Bruce Tucker help contemporary readers understand racial relations in the South in the shadow yeah. of Jim Crow? Because, you know, lots of us have read about the Jim Crow South and looked mm -hmm. at different angles of it. But this is a very uh, distinctive angle looking at mm -hmm. race relations. It's a really good question. And I, I think it, it raises a really fundamental point about history and understanding history that we'll get to later. Um, but my immediate response to it is, you know, the broader context and how could it have happened? And, you know, what does it say about race relations at that point uh, in Richmond, Virginia in 68? And, and, and my response um, was 
that sociology, as, as sociologists said at the time, you know, a black man who was wheeled into an emergency room uh, in any large urban hospital, I mean, I don't care if it's Richmond or Atlanta or New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago, who has alcohol in their breath in particular, um, that they were considered that there's a term that I'd never heard because I'm not a sociologist, but they were, so, quote, socially dead, socially dead. And that's why in my book, I, you know, as someone who'd read The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, you know, right away, I thought, well, th here's another case of the, in, quote, invisibility of African-Americans. And, and so the words of, I, I quoted medical historian um, of, from Wisconsin, Susan Lederer, um, who, who said, social death is what happens when a hospital patient, quote, is treated essentially as a corpse, though perhaps still clinically or, quote, biologically alive, end quote. And then she noted that that was just add to it um, when black men had alcohol in their breath or in their blood. So given that national context, you know, things were all the more stacked against Bruce Tucker. Um, I've always said he was definitely, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time to have going with the head injury. Not only were these doctors like, you know, recruiting, looking out for a guy like him, but the conditions in Richmond, Virginia and other, you know, Southern cities and Midwestern cities, other cities too, there was still so much de facto segregation. The, the hospital had just only recently desegregated, both in terms of its, its wards, but also its programs. And most of the caregivers were still white. And when it came to the wider community relations, remember 1968, May, month before Martin Luther King was assassinated. There were up the road, there were no, there's not a lot of arson in, in Richmond, 100 miles north in DC, where I lived in, in high school at the time. I remember seeing the flames coming up over the Potomac River. So very tense time. So this became a factor, this, uh, so, I guess you could say sort of socio-political environment um, uh, came, it became a factor in this story. Um, and, I, and I dug into as much as I could and tried to find anyone that knew what happened. When the doctors, Drs. Lauer and Hume, they were, they were so eager, the clock was ticking, that's why I have the chronology, to remove his heart, almost from the moment he came in. So they call the Richmond police. Well, what are the Richmond police gonna do? You know, they, and I, I have as much information I can get from the court record about what seems to have happened when they went to this rooming house in North Richmond. So it was futile and it was kind of a farce. Um, and so the last thing I'll say is if you read the book, you know, you, you'll see that the only need, thing they needed to do was look inside his trousers and his brother William's business card was there. And that's a, that was tragic. And when I first interviewed Doug Wilder in 2017, I'm like, you know, I'm like, you kidding. So that's the context and that's how I kind of pieced it together. So do you wanna to go to the PowerPoint now or you wanna ask a question? Uh, no, going into your PowerPoint, I think would be uh, great. Okay. We'll see it fire up. These are, you know, till I see it up here. Um, the, this is a, a Jody Costi is the medical archivist here in town at, at VCU, and she's been a great help to me. So I, I got, I want to give her a lot of credit for put it, sharing this with me and letting me share it with, um, you know, groups like this. Um, so you'll see here, these are some sample headlines. Um, you probably can't see the small print. The dates are from 1962 and 1963, and you'll see, you know, like MCV six convict donors. So they're, this was part of their kidney program that, doc, that Dr. Uh, Hume, who's pictured there on the right, David Hume, uh, was running. He had been recruited from Harvard in the mid 50s to bump up the reputation of MCV. Um, you'll see that headline says, a uh, NCV staff has performed 10 transplants of kidneys. And you probably can't see it, but the, the byline there is by a guy named Bev Orndorff, who I actually worked with in the 90s at the Times Dispatch. And he's a wonderful guy. And just a historical aside, he was one of the first medical science writers in the United States because 
and some of some of your more mature viewers might remember there was a thing called Sputnik in 1957, and the Russians sent that up. There was this huge outcry about how we we were behind the Russians in math and science. And uh, you know, it's interesting to think about what people are finding about in schools today versus that. You know, raising up the level of math and science. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So that's David uh, Hume on the right. Um, it's part of a, uh, uh, next to a journal article about renal uh, homo transplantation, uh, you know, uh, kidney, kidney transplants. And he, there's Hume on the right, and that's his team um, uh, at MCV. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, this slide gets to a very key part of the story, which is Norman Shumway, who, who is pictured there and also is the third uh, from the left in the laboratory in the basement of the old Stanford University Hospital in San, what was downtown San Francisco in the mid 50s, when young Richard Lauer, who's a skinny guy on the far right with the glasses showed up and met him. And you'll see in the book how uh, Shumway was just like working on his own and trying to, to develop a way to use deep uh, cold to preserve organs. And that came, interesting enough, from the University of Minnesota in the 50s, and he came from Minnesota. And Lauer had planned a much more conventional career, but he got inveigled by Shumway. And uh, next thing you know, they were chasing down dogs in the alleys of uh, San Francisco. Next slide. So there on the left, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can you go back one? Thank you. So there on the left, uh, on the left, far left is Shumway and there's uh, Lauer next to him. And I don't know the name of the gentleman on his knees, but, and there's one of the dogs that they probably uh, operated. They, they did hundreds, I don't, if not, but probably hundreds, if not thousands of animal uh, heart transplants, especially dogs in the, from 55 to about 65. And that is, uh, that's Dr. Lauer uh, in the middle. Next slide. So here's the headline from uh, the Times Dispatch. Um, again, it's my friend Beverly Orndorf, dog heart transplant at MCV is successful. And what's interesting about this, the date is January 12th, 1967. So as from what I said earlier, by the end of the year, by December, uh, it, this would happen in Cape Town with Christian Barnard. Um, and I kind of got a kick, even though there are issues, obviously, about animals in medical research, and I won't try to <laughs> solve that here, but there is an interesting line here in the, um, in the story that says that uh, um, a dog had received a transplanted heart, had, had lived for a year and managed to give birth to a litter of six puppies, and that's what this is about. And Bev wrote, quote, this event is tied in with a larger lesson being learned by MCV scientists, namely heart transplants are moving from the realm of possibility to probability and how right he proved by the end of the year. Next slide. So this is Dr. Lauer on the left with his research team uh, conducting some type of operation on an animal. Um, and some of you may have heard recently the news out of the University of Maryland where a man got a uh, genetically altered uh, pig's heart and there's the whole story there. And that, that story out of Maryland reminded me of so much of what I had already uh, learned writing my book. Next slide. Um, maybe we'll go on to the next one, please. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Christian Barnard. And he's a very interesting, fascinating character. Um, you'll see the headline on the front of the Times Dispatch on uh, December 4th, uh, 1967, surgery team chief worked at MCV in 66. So what's interest, what interesting for the local readers was that he had actually studied here in Richmond, became, a, became this international celebrity. And uh, this became a major source, in, in my view, from everything I read and all the oral histories and all the indicators, all the people I interviewed who knew Hume and Lauer. It, but especially for Hume, this became a point 
of professional jealousy because in his view, well, for one thing, he did not give enough credit to Lauer and Hume and what he learned from them. And he learned the deep, cold techniques as well as different surgical techniques in Richmond. And so this led, in my view, to the, the push uh, by Hume to his protege Lauer to do, 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 do it, we gotta do it. And I think it added in terms of ethics, there's a, a, the professional ethics question, what happens when people are under professional pressure and the price of ambition? Um, next slide is blank and then the one after that, please. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is Dr. Lauer again, Richard Lauer on the left. And um, on the right is the uh, MCV hospital at the time of the Bruce Tucker transplant. He was rolled into the emergency room on the right bottom, the base of that, just from about a mile away on a hill called Church Hill in Richmond, which is where uh, St. John's Church was. That's where Patrick Henry did his give me liberty or give me death speech. That's why it's called Church Hill. But it's right down there in the capital area. You could throw a spitball across the street at the state capitol. So all this happened uh, really literally in the shadows of uh, a lot of history and a lot of power in Richmond. And um, uh, the, the uh, transplant went into, as we said before, Joseph Klatt, who was from Orange, Virginia, was a businessman who had chronic heart disease and he uh, was he was near death. He, he had been treated at the University of Virginia Hospital until he finally agreed to be considered uh, for an experimental transplant if a suitable heart could be found. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the headline that was on the front of the Richmond Times Dispatch on May 26, 1968, which was the day after the heart was taken from Tucker heart transplant operation uh, performed here by MCV. Next slide. So on the right, you see the gentleman who, uh, Joseph Klett. I should add, in case people are wondering, he only lived for eight days after the transplant. So the following, like by the following Sunday, I'm gonna say, or the following weekend, he passed away. And it was because of uh, tissue rejection. And those were always the issues for the, for the doctors at that point was the, the immune systems and the way the body would reject uh, a, um, you know, outside, outside element or outside uh, tissue. Um, and on the left of this slide, you'll see a little historical context. Uh, this was the 16th heart transplant in the world ninth heart transplant in the United States and the first in Virginia. Okay, next please. So that's my friend Bev uh, at his, uh, the old teletype machine in the late sixties. And th the reason I like this picture is because he is, Bev is a very low key person, but you know, hardly sort of a, you know, Bob Woodward type reporter, but, and he had a great relationship with the doctors uh, because he had personally like publicized for almost a decade, a lot of their achievements. But as soon as he dared to write about something they didn't want written, which was who the donor was and put a human face on him, he was ostracized and they didn't speak to him. They didn't let him in the surgery department for a whole year. Next slide. So here's the first, uh, uh, time that Bruce Tucker, the donor's name was in the paper, it was about three days after the operation. Uh, heart donor identified, this is a photo of Bruce Tucker. It says Dinwiddie native, Dinwiddie's Dinwiddie County, about an hour south of Richmond, right near Petersburg, Virginia, out in the country. Um, and uh, the circumstances of, of how Bev got this are in the book, but it basically boiled down to the university didn't announce the news, but the funeral home director called in his obituary and said to the, back then when he had huge newspaper staffs, uh, said, hey, you know, this is the guy that was part of the famous operation. And Bev managed within about an hour to put, knock out this story. Next slide, please. So this is uh, St. Philip Hospital. And Laura, you ask about 
you know, the context of, of Jim Crow South and racism. Well, this was still, this was the racially segregated uh, hospital until the mid 1960s. Um, but as you'll see in the book, it was often used, you know, all, up until the time of, of the Tucker transplant for experimental research. And it was like this deal that the hosp white hospital administrator had cut with Hume to do kind of strange, like the baboon uh, stuff that I got into and the monkeys and all this strange animal research. Well, they did it in, in, in what was still, you know, still known as the black, the black ward. And uh, this is also where uh, it turned out that Bruce's brother, William, learned the tragic news that his older brother was dead. And when he talked to the, to the hospital officials at the time, they didn't share the news that his heart had been taken. And that's where it happened on the second floor of St. Philip's. Next slide, please. So I like this slide because it shows two different views of the story, depending on your lens. The, the left side comes from the Richmond newspapers, questions arise on heart donor. The right side, uh, the Richmond Afro-American, which is black owned, says, heart, say heart was snatched. So that became known as the heart snatch in the black press. And this was, I think, a reflection of the kind of suspicions, rightly so, of the medical establishment. We can talk about the pandemic because I still hear echoes of this uh, today, but it, is, it was interesting. One of the things I tried to do in my book with, as much as possible was to show different voices uh, that ev even as, as a white reporter, when I was working, I wasn't as aware of, of that as I should have been uh, in news coverage. So next slide, please. So these are the, uh, when Doug Wilder finally filed the, the, the suits uh, in 1971, it was the first wrongful death. It was the first claim for wrongful death. It's a civil claim in the civil courts, not a criminal case, because no, no criminal charges were filed, which is another interesting question. But wrongful death, it was the first one in a heart transplant uh, case in the United States. And it says there in the left headline that they sued for a million dollars, or yeah, a million dollars, but it was whittled down because of uh, pretrial rulings by the judge. Next, please. And I'm almost done. Um, this is Old City Hall in downtown Richmond. And this is where the 1972 trial happened that I write about. And it's right down there on the Capitol grounds. It has beautiful uh, Gothic revival style art of architecture. And it was, uh, it was where a lot of drama happened in the courtroom for a whole week. Next slide. And this is Doug Wilder looking very dapper as uh, during his time as a state senator in the 1970s. So while he was, um, while he was representing the Tucker family, he was also um, he was also doing a lot of uh, advocacy as the only. Uh, the only uh, African American in the state Senate of Virginia, and one of one of the things that he he kept pushing was uh, right away get rid of the old uh, state song uh, "Carry Me Back to Old Virginia," and that took decades, which is amazing to think about because it was so racist. Next next slide. Uh, I think you went backwards. I'm sorry. Maybe maybe keep going. Yeah, next one. Next one. There you go. That's the attorney for uh, Jack Russell, which is an interesting name for a for a uh, defense attorney. And he very interesting guy. And he actually created medical malpractice in Virginia. No, there was no there was no field of that practice. And uh, he uh, actually became he would use the MCV doctors to be their expert witnesses. And then he, he wound up teaching at MCV kind of as an adjunct. Uh, to try to teach doctors and nurses how not to get sued. Next slide. So this is Christian Compton, and I have a lot in the book about him. He's a very interesting guy. Um, he tried basically in the store in the trial in '72 to weigh the balance the tenets of Virginia law as it should be applied in the case with the new field of research that 
had been just coming along in, in 68 from Harvard, the Ad Hoc Commission on Brain Death, just coming along. And what happened was, while there's, and the Tuckers were outgunned in the courtroom, they didn't have the money to bring in expert witnesses. The, uh, the state of uh, Russell and the state of Virginia did, and they just brought, you know, expert after expert to say brain death is, is real, it should, it should be considered in the case. And you'll see in the, in the, in the chapters that I wrote about the, about the trial that um, Compton finally allowed it in. And, judge, and circuit judges, at least in Virginia, do that at times in order to, to let the legislator know, legislature know that the law needs to be changed. And he, he was convinced of that. And that's, I think that's why he did it. He later was elevated to the Virginia Supreme Court and I was fortunate to give out 100 pages of his handwritten notes at Washington Lee University Law School, and I supplemented everything with his own notes in the book. Okay, next slide, I got that. Two more. And here's a quote. Very strange thing about this story to me was Lauer and his attitude towards a civil lawsuit, but he kept saying he could go to prison. And I interviewed Lauer's wife, Anne, a wonderful woman, but why did he keep thinking that? And she couldn't say. But but you'll see this quote where he, I'll just jump in. He says uh, he says the first difficulty I think on the first day when somebody mentioned the word malpractice and the judge he sort of said it. Hold it right there. This is not a case of malpractice. This is a case of wrongful death. And so it gives us all a little pause. Lara said because wow I wasn't insured against you know wrongful death. I mean we're talking like murder. And I just found that interesting from a psychological point of view that he held on to that, whereas Hume didn't care. He, he loved all the attention. Next slide. So another heart snatch headline, uh, a mistaken headline there that say the Virginia ru jury ruled that death occurs and brain death when brain dies. That wasn't really true, but that's the way someone summarized it. Next slide. I'm going to wrap these up. We'll go to the next set of questions. Um, so that this is, if you come to Richmond ever, this is the, on the left, you'll see a plaque, unless they get rid of it, which I suggested in one of my columns about this whole thing, it's called the birthplace of cardiac transplantation. Uh, and it notes that Lauer and Hume and other things about their program, you can't really read the small print, but it makes no mention either of Bruce Tucker or of the man who received the heart, Clat. And uh, then on the right, you'll see something you can you can find it online if you go to MCV Foundation and uh, heart transplant. This was just a couple of years ago, and they added that they when my book came out, they added this sort of disclaimer that's sort of a non-apology for the whole story. <laughs> so that's it. That's the slideshow. Thank you for your attention on it. <laughs> that was uh, that was really terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just to help clarify for folks who might be wondering, uh, MCV and VCU have been used sort of interchangeably. Yes, so that's MCV, true. Medical College of Virginia, VCU, Virgin, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. So we're talking about same place and a name change, basically. Yeah, what happened was like a lot of universities, they wanted to rebrand themselves. So they went from being MCV in the 90s to VCU whatever they are now. I can't ever remember. No, the Virginia, VCU School of Medicine. Um, all right. So based on the evidence you collected, do you have a sense for why Dr. Richard Lauer, the renowned heart surgeon, and Dr. David Hume, the chairman of surgery at the Medical College of Virginia, failed to inform the family and receive their consent for, uh, before taking Bruce Tucker's heart and kidneys? Well... Um, honestly, it, um, it, it, why they did it, I think it was just, it was just part of what, what they saw as, um, what they saw as, first of all, trying to save Mr. Klett's life. Um, I don't think they gave much thought to, you, you asked me how, um, wh why they failed to inform. I think, I think they feel, they felt like they checked, there were no 
there, there were no real safeguards in place. So from their perspective, they were known as, you know, back then the gods in white coats had very little supervision. There was very little institutional control over experiments. They felt like they had made a good faith effort to find him. And um, so I actually, I feel like, I feel like Hume pushed Lauer so much that when um, clinically he had a patient who looked like he would he would benefit from from finally trying the um, experiment that Lauer felt ethically okay about doing it, um, but in terms of um, failure to inform the family, it really didn't seem to come up. They, they worked so quickly because they wanted to um, keep the heart viable, and they were using their their Lauer's research and some ways to keep it cold that they could they they broke the law purposely because according to the law they should have waited 24 hours is that, that law is still on the books and also as, as i say uh, many times there was no provision for brain death uh in decision making but they declared brain death and they brought in a, an eeg expert and of course from an ethicist point of view you know i read not too long ago in the uh, transplantation ethics book um that you would never just do one EEG and then say someone was flatlining. That's that's what happened. Well, and something else that you had uh, mentioned in your book too is that they are coming to Bruce Tucker's bedside with for the presumption that he was uh, without family, that he must be indigent because he was a black man with alcohol in his breath, right? That's true. And I actually was told, uh, I don't identify the position he was there because he asked me not to. But um, he remembered the assumption on the staff's part that this man was not going to pay his bills. So, quote, you know, so a freeloader. Yeah. Um, and I want to jump to a really great question from one of our attendees. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie Jackson says there is a black kidney transplant pioneer from Lexa, Arkansas, Dr. Mm -hmm. Samuel. Uh, Kuntz, I might be mispronouncing that name, hmm. uh, who is a graduate of Arkansas's only land grant HBCU, University hmm. of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Can oh. you offer any uh, information about the role of African American transplant surgeons in preventing incidents such as this? Hmm. I wish I could. I, I, I honestly can't. I think that's a great question. And I, I can only say this that. In this particular story, there were so many elements that I zeroed in on what happened here. And, and, I, and I hope that there's enough, and I really don't mean to say this to deflect from that question, because honestly, I, I really can't um, address that. But I do hope that people such as that asking great questions like that and researchers and historians, physicians explore these questions because there, there could be, I mean, there, there, I see it as part of our national reckoning, our, our discussion about race. And I see that my book is a tool in that. And, and I'm glad it is part of that. But um, yeah, the only thing that comes, I, I don't have any information in my book about HBCUs uh, and, and their role. Um, there was, there's a strange case from the University of Mississippi Dr. Hardy, who got involved in trying to use an, an animal heart in a, in a, in a um, I think a black man. And so there were ethical issues not too far from Arkansas, but that one I'm not aware of. And uh, there's also a question uh, from Mary Louise Cantwell, who says, were there any white religious leaders who protested the illegal harvest? Mm. Nope, there were not. Um, and even, I think in the black community at large here, there was a lot of suspicion. I don't know of any organized um, objection because I don't know that people could put it together that quickly as a story. Um, I do know, and I did, I did find evidence in the book that soon after, um, because of the political tension in Richmond that black uh, city council members seized on the story and talked about passing a law to prevent MCV from doing um, things like this in the future. It never went anywhere, but it clearly, it, it clearly hit some nerves. 
but but in terms of the, the I will say this, the, the faith leadership of black leader, uh, religious leaders in Richmond, they did blow the whistle on uh, terrible conditions at St. Philip Hospital in the late 40s. And I did include that in the book. It was very interesting. Um, and the, and those were, there were some black physicians involved in that effort because they were terrible conditions with rats and bad sanitation. And they basically embarrassed MCV during World War II to clean things up. Uh, and there's a question from uh, Jamie Watson, the uh, plaque that you showed in your uh -huh. slides, it says that this was the case of the birthplace of cardiac transplantation, right? So VC <laughs> is claiming it's the birthplace, but at the same time, this was the ninth heart transplant. That's a good... 16th in the world. Yeah, so you caught him. That's... That? <laughs> I think they were saying this is the birthplace in Virginia, but I don't want to be the apologist for MCV, but I think that was the case, but that's a very good point. That's false advertising. Yes. Um, so I want to jump to the question of what do you hope Orient Thieves conveys to readers? And mm. has the pandemic shaped how you think about Bruce Tucker and all the research you completed for this book? Um, yeah. I think first and foremost, first and foremost, I should say, is that I just want, I started out just wanting to get the story out in the public domain because it had never been told. Um, and in doing so, to con I hope it conveys how recently injustices have been allowed and um, uh, to, to happen and to fester sometimes in, in parts of the medical community uh, kind of writ large against Black Americans in general, and and to this person in particular, Bruce Tucker. And secondly, you know, I really hope that it, as I said before, it adds to the national dialogue or whatever you want to call it, reckoning about race and teaching about racism, especially you know lately since it's been opposed in some states, including Virginia, uh, by trying to ignore or or sort of spin past injustices or justify them. So I do, I, one of my hopes is uh, that the organ thieves will be used in schools and colleges. And I think I shared earlier with you, Laura, that um, I'm glad that Virginia Commonwealth University, home of the hospital, is gonna use it for its entering freshman class this fall. And uh, so continuing the dialogue. And, and the last thing I, I, I often quote from the theologian Richard Rohr, who said, you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. You cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. So I really think that hospitals and schools and, and other groups, church groups, uh, you know, Episcopal Church I'm part of has the Sacred Ground Program. Uh, they're trying to acknowledge past mistakes, including here in Richmond and, and all over the place. And um, so um, I, really, I really feel like right now in the United States, if we all sort of put our heads back in the ground and stay in the dark about the facts of history and doing the hard work of, of addressing wrongdoing, um, that we're just rewinding the past and, and we're gonna, in any of us could wind up in the same situation that Bruce Tucker wound up in. Um, the pandemic itself, uh, the book came out um, in the middle of it and it, has, has led to a lot of discussions, especially with black readers and commentators and reviewers about, you know, things I didn't know about as much when I wrote the book, just that ongoing suspicion of being treated fairly. And um, I think by having events like this, Laura, I mean, I think you're doing a great job of making sure that we have these discussions. Well, all, uh, all credit goes to CALS in that regard. So uh, <laughs> big thank you to CALS for organizing this event. Um, so we do have a few other questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kevin Mosby, uh, if, if I may, I'm gonna um, just paraphrase a little bit, is asking about, you know, your subtitle says the shocking story of the first heart transplant in the segregated South. Mm -hmm. And the uh, question is about the word shocking, right? That when we look at the reality of medical racism, uh, medical mm -hmm. apartheid, then it's maybe not so shocking, right? That black yeah. people's bodies are used to advance medical science 
to treat white people as put by our participant. Fair enough. Uh, point, point taken. And yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think, honestly, I think shocking is overused. And I will tell your, your people who are writers in your audience, two things. If you, if you work with large publishers, you have to negotiate titles and covers and you don't have a whole lot of power over them. So I, that's a very good point. Yeah, and I mean, unfortunately, for a lot of uh, students, for a lot of the lay public, um, it still is, right, shocking hearing about, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these, these revelations, these discoveries from investigative journalism. Uh, you know, I think of some of the language that was used in the pandemic even, right, when we talk about, um, you know, the increased uh, vulnerability, exacerbated vulnerabilities of people in nursing homes and mm -hmm. uh, essential workers who are often, uh, you know, black people uh, and other racial minorities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the almost surprise that was announced, right? And yeah. Like, out yeah. Like, well, it's, it's not so surprising. It right? should as be. As long as You're we're right. paying attention, but it's yes. still worth emphasizing of course it's true and it's a cliche so i learned something every time i have a, a a discussion like this so thank you for that that's a that's a very good point uh janet bowen asks what were the conditions of the legal settlement there were no there was no legal settlement they didn't get a penny from from the jury and uh i have also and others have suggested that the tucker family still deserves reparations for this and which leads me to my, my, my guess is <laughs> the reason there's been no apology is because that's, that's a tough question for large institutions. Um, so nothing, um, I did mention to you before we started, um, if you read the book, you'll see his son Abraham is in the book. And I did, I did uh, try to interview him for the book and he declined and I respected that. Uh, and it's taken two years, but I finally talked to him just two weeks ago, and I was glad to hear that he, he, he personally felt um, like he got something out of the book and is very supportive of, of it. I was very, you know, there are a lot of ethical issues in terms of writing and journalism and nonfiction and history that I, I crossed. There are a lot of lines there that I personally, it was an experience for me because I was not trying to re-traumatize him. But um, I felt like he, he, you know, just mentioning it could, you know, bring it up. And he, and he told me, actually, and he said I could share this with people because I asked him this. Um, and so you're the first group I've actually talked to since I talked to him, I think. Um, he doesn't, he's not asking for an apology. His point of view is he wants to leave it in the past. And uh, his exact quote to me was, I've seen the world and I don't like what I've seen. Did he seem um, open to maybe the university trying to honor uh, his contribution in some way? I mean, while acknowledging, right, this was not a willing <laughs> or consented for contribution right. in any way. Right. It's a good question, but it, he's not. He's, it, he's absolutely not interested in, because I mentioned it to him, that there were going to be a number of programs next fall around the common book, and it would be uh, amazing to do something like that. And I've tried talking to some um, African-American politicians in the city trying to do something like that. Um, but um, again, I, I honor him and respect him. He's not, uh, it's just not what he wants to do now. Maybe he'll change, you know, maybe he'll think about it. And the good thing is, is as you know, as a physician and an ethicist, we, just to have the conversation you know, is a good thing. At least it was for me because it, it answered. I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure that I hadn't heard him and he told me I hadn't. So I felt better as a human being. Thank you for that. Uh, Sue Bryant asked, did you do any research on the donor for the first heart transplant in Arkansas by any chance? I did not. And uh, the, the, the truth is um, under, the, <laughs> under the deadline that I was under, to write this book, I, I couldn't veer away from the, the, basically the Tucker transplant and some of the things that happened at Stanford and some of the things that happened in Cape Town, South Africa. But again, 
people who are researchers, writers, historians, I'm sure that there is a, not only a lot of good stories in terms of just good narrative, but important stories to, to bring up. So I, I hope to see those in the future. Yeah, I mean, so much of what we hear about, you know, the history of transplant is a very romantic story, mm -hmm. right? uh, a glorified story. And um, I, I appreciate that Organ Thieves looks at this other side of it, of the uh, sacrifices by uh, so many uh, Black people in just the, the surrounding area, right? And the fear of walking around uh, the university at night that your body's going to get snatched. I mean, it's, yes. it's hard, you know, to uh, maybe imagine uh, for certain readers having that kind of experience with a medical institution, but that mm -hmm. same kind of fear of medical institutions um, persists today where it's not, right, uh, an irrational fear. It's not distrust for distrust's sake. It's because people in positions of power did not act trustworthy. Um, yes. And, and to your earlier question about Jim Crow, you know, the, the fallout that when you mentioned that about the night doctors, what, what Doug Waller said, he was warned about don't don't walk around the hospital. You might be snatched up. I, it reminded me that of, of some of the academic research that I read about how um, during the Jim Crow era that creating that fear of being snatched was part of the basic terrorism of white governments, just like with the Ku Klux Klan of trying to raise the fear level. So those fears were introduced for a reason um, and nobody was around dissuading the African-American community that, that could happen because the, 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 the white establishment you know, ran stuff, even though they did it with in, in Richmond with a black man who lived in the bottom of the hospital who couldn't leave the hospital because he was in fear for his life because some of the black folks who lived nearby were taking shots at him. So if, during Black Lives Matter, as we've seen a lot of things come out about fear and trepidation. And, and I found that was very much the case in what was going on around the medical college for a long, long time. Um, have any of the doctors or their families spoken about this case or offered a Apologies, this is a question from Stephanie oh. Jackson. No, doc, if you read the book, you'll know Dr. Hume perished fairly quickly afterwards. And I, I won't spoil how that happened because it's a story in and of itself. Dr. Lauer was here for a long time. He passed away from cancer. Um, so I haven't heard anything from any family members. Um, I will say this, Dr. Lauer got out of surgery and became a free clinic doctor here in Richmond and uh, at the end of his life. And one of the weird six degree of separation stories for me is my own daughter was in a leadership program and one of her first things was doing work at the medical clinic where he worked and she, she was Dr. Lauer's first Spanish interpreter when she was 17 years old. So, you know, uh, no apologies, but I, but I, you know, I often wonder whether he went into free clinic work for a reason, but I'm speculating. Uh, we have an anonymous attendee who's asked uh, if you've experienced backlash for writing this book. Uh, they say, I am in the medical world and uh, they deal with brain death and organ donation and manage heart transplant patients often and find that there can be uh, negative connotations experienced by families of the black community when we do approach them about these topics and mm. can only assume this event as well as many other events are the background of this distrust. Interesting. Uh, this literally happened two generations ago. So uh, just generally, do you have a response to that? kind of? Well, I haven't personally gotten a lot of backlash and you know, in, in any of my public appearances, I always say that I'm not uh, trying to convince people not to don't donate organs or anything like that. You know, um, I will say this, Northwestern University uh, used my book, uh, or at least NBC did in Chicago in conjunction with um, a program Northwestern has in the medical school. And, and, they, and so <clears throat> they, were, they were addressing those types of suspicions about, you know, 
organ donation in the black community. Um, and one of the things I learned from the NBC correspondent who interviewed me was, I think the number was 12 to 15. There are only 12 transplant surgeons in the United States right now in 2022 who are African-American. That just blew my mind. Now, I'm, don't, don't hold me that number, but that's, that's the way. So, so there's a, um, a series called Race in Chicago, I think, on NBC5. You can, you can Google it. It was, it was very good. And so I was glad that somehow my book was used uh, in that context to talk about working together to overcome distrust. Uh, well, we are nearing the end of time. Uh, if anyone has uh, another question that they'd like to put into the Q&A or the chat, I'll keep uh, an eye on it. Um, is there any more that you would like to emphasize about your book, Mr. Jones? Um, not really. I mean, I don't want to make a sales pitch, but it, it is out in paperback yesterday. So <laughs> I always, my agent would kill me if I didn't say that. Um, I, uh, I hope that uh, we're, we're talking about doing a podcast. Um, um, and so that's on the table. And we may have something in the future that builds out um, from this story more things about Richmond. Uh, we call it one square block in Richmond. It takes that one square block uh, downtown where all these things happen. Because, for example, Edgar Allan Poe is part of the, uh, the general story there that I can't get into here, but his mother, Eliza, was an actress at, a, at the theater that burned down and killed 70 people right next door to where the Tucker transplant hit. So Edgar Allan Poe and all of the strangeness in Richmond is something I couldn't spend an, enough time on the book because it's too far along. So there's just, there's just a lot of other things that uh, I hope to get into in the future. Great. Um, and uh, Kim Mosby has asked, do you have any worries for, or have you experienced of any pushback for expounding upon this history of the mistreatment of black Americans? You're writing about Virginia where they are currently banning some different <laughs> history. Well, I'm glad, you know, I just submitted, I hope they run it. I submitted a column to Education Week this week. <laughs> Probably won't run, but it was about that issue because the, the new governor set, set up a quote tip line basically for yeah, agree parents to complain about, you know, material or books that they don't like. And to me that, you know, is like Nazi Germany or like the McCarthy era. Uh, and the, if you haven't read Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, just pick it up. It predicted this. And um, so I, I feel, I didn't write this book for this reason because I didn't know that we were going to enter into this sort of retrenchment nationally about history. <laughs> I'll stay off the political side, but retrenchment. And I really, I'm, I'm glad that my book is in the thick of that. And, and I guess I might have been, and I don't mean to sound boastful or anything, but it might've been the thing I was prepared to do because I spent five years in Richmond, Virginia, the heart of the tobacco industry with Philip Morris and the largest cigarette comp, uh, Marlboro plant in the world, I think until China built something bigger. Uh, and so I spent five years doing nothing but writing about all of their secret research to addict teenagers. So I guess maybe that was good preparation. Maybe, I don't know, we'll find out. Maybe I can come back sometime. Great. Uh, and Michelle Moore asked, do you plan to write more books about similar topics? Uh, that's a very good question. Probably not uh, medical in nature because, um, you know, I was an English major and I feel like I got a master's level uh, uh, <laughs> series of education about medical history. Um, once we do this podcast, getting more into history, um, I... Um, I have some other ideas for writing. One of them is to write about being, uh, I might write a memoir now, it's been a novel. I went through the Holland's writing program here in Virginia and started years ago about being the son of a Marine general during Vietnam. So I've, I'm fascinated a little bit about the period I grew up in in the 60s in the high desert of California. Uh, so um, uh, that's probably will be my next, my next effort, God willing and uh, nobody, um, no one shows up in a rescue vehicle and takes me away somewhere. 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Chip Jones. Thank you to CALS for hosting this. Uh, and Nathan Smith for uh, mm -hmm. being the CALS representative to facilitate all this. And thank you to everyone for coming and participating. Thank you, Laura. My pleasure. <laughs>